Hello, I'm Bill Harris. Welcome to Life Questions, a program that focuses on issues of life from a biblical perspective. The questions that we received are from viewers like you, and they cover so many concerns about life, from politics to paying tithes to moral issues to problems of youth and everything in between. Now, later on in our program, we'll be telling you how you can send us your questions. But for now, we have invited a panel of experts to address your questions, and I'd like to introduce them to you right now. First off, we have Pastor Chris Ewing of the County Line Church of the Brethren in the Herod area. Secondly, Pastor Ted Bible, an appropriate name here, <laughs> at St. Mark's United Methodist Church, also of Lima. Third is Pastor Jesse K uh, Kaler, of uh, the Archbold Evangelical Church, and last, Pastor Nathan Branham of Grace Fellowship Church, also here in Lima. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you with us. Good to be here. And judging from the letters and the feedback that we've received, I think we've got some good discussion to, uh, ahead of us today. I want to begin with the season that we're in by talking of the significance of the virgin birth. When Christ came into this world, why was it a situation where God said, and well, Isaiah prophesied it, you know, a virgin shall conceive. Why the virgin birth, gentlemen? Um, well, my mind goes to, you know, Romans 5, 12. It says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, so sin entered into the world through Adam and then is inherited through every male from therefore or going forward. So when Mary, being a virgin and then giving birth as a virgin, she did not, or Jesus did not inherit the sin that would have come through the father versus through the mother. Mm -hmm. So that's the simple part of it. So <laughs> yeah. I, I think the virgin birth also refers to really the question of an earthly father. Why is he an earthly father? Mm -hmm. Well, his, his heavenly father was his father, and that's so important because it says the child is to be called holy. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus' death was going to be valuable or significant in any way, it had to be a death that could account for the sins of mankind. And that meant he had to be perfect. He had to be of God. So I think the virgin birth speaks both of his humanity, mm -hmm. but also his divinity. And that, that just speaks to his, his dual nature, if you will. Yeah. Remember with Isaiah, I was mentioning that um, uh, a message that I recorded here for this time of the year to be airing is a child is born, a son is given. The child representing mm -hmm. his humanity, the son representing his divinity. Any more that you want to add to that, though? Well, the scripture is Isaiah seven fourteen. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So in addition to what you've said, and you've actually expressed it, uh, God himself is supernatural. So mm -hmm. this, yeah. this would set the Messiah apart. His birth was supernatural, that, and it would simply exemplify who he was when he came. And, and we know that the life and ministry of Jesus was characterized uh, by miracles. And, and that was the thing that set him apart. You said he was holy. And uh, supernatural signs and wonders are the thing that make Jesus who he is and demonstrate to us that he has the power uh, to command the natural elements yeah. and, and to turn back the natural order of things. So. Yeah. And he's been referred to, a Pastor, uh, Pastor Bible, as the second Adam in his coming. Yeah, right. Uh, I think it's exciting to think about, you know, th just the, the purity of Jesus, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, Adam had it set up. I mean, he had it, he had it going on. He did. Until, <laughs> you know, <laughs> until he fell, uh -huh. you know. And so Christ came as that second Adam, and he was perfect, and he never fell. You know, he never got it. He never entered into sin. There was no temptation that he he was not able to overcome. You know, and so yeah, he was he was the second Adam. He was he was the perfect Adam. Mm -hmm. There had to be a there had to be a, a a perfect person to to sacrifice and represent us. It couldn't be somebody that had sin like us. Right. It had to be somebody that, that was perfect. Right. Well, and it's interesting mm -hmm. when you go go through all the Old Testament. Um, especially in Exodus, you know, when, when God is taking the Israelites out of Egypt, um, Egypt um, you know, he says that you, you must go through all these things so that not only the Egyptians know, but that the Israelites know that I am God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if there wasn't this supernatural birth, if, if there wasn't this super crazy thing that happened, you know, this was a sign of saying, look, 
I am God. I mean, there is the, all that theological stuff of where, where Jesus is sinless and, and, and all that stuff. But this was God starting a new chapter with the, the mm -hmm. new Adam saying, mm -hmm. hey, pay attention. Something amazing is happening here and you will know it's amazing because here is the first sign. Mm -hmm. Pastor Chris, you alluded back to Genesis and in Genesis chapter 3 and verse uh, 15, uh, we refer to this as the Proto-Evangelion, which is the first gospel. Prophecy. And notice what it says. It says, it shall bruise thy head uh, and you shall bruise it. Let me, I missed something there. Your seed and her seed. Yeah. So it's yes. talking about the seed of the woman, which is, you know, throughout the rest of the scripture, you see where it, you know, children are often referred to as the fruit of, Ad, you know, the Abraham's loin, the yeah. man, right? Yeah. But now all the way back here, we have the seed of the woman. Yeah. And that's so powerful because that's all it was. Yeah. It was the seed. Yeah. Uh, with the Holy Spirit combined. So Christ. it was biologically incorrect to yes. say the seed of a woman because women don't bear seeds. Mm -hmm. yes. It's the man that bears the seed. Mm -hmm. Biologically incorrect, but spiritually very correct. Very, yes. correct. <laughs> very, very correct. Yeah. I think that even speaking of the sacrificial system is very important when you think of the virgin birth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. The sacrificial system was really specific in the Old Testament about what kind of animal were you going to sacrifice? Yes. An innocent <laughs> one, a pure one, right? right. Mm -hmm. So his virgin birth speaks <clears throat> to his holiness, his, his God, his Godwardness, if you will. And that's what uh, the author of Hebrews, which I don't know, who exactly it is, maybe <laughs> leaning towards Paul, I don't know, but uh, it speaks to, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise yeah. partook of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So he had to be of man, but he had to be of God to redeem all mankind. That something? So that's just beautiful. It's just yeah, beautiful. It is, and it really he was even, our true representative. Even looking at oh. the sacrificial, like you said, like there were different types of sacrifices depending on where you were in the hierarchy of the community. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus Christ being the son, I mean, it, it covers, everybody covers everybody entirely. Um, it doesn't matter if you're the high priest or, or just the lowliest person. The sacrifice that Jesus would be would cover it all. Mm -hmm. So when you look at, um, you know, King Herod found out that this baby King Messiah had been born and um, tried to convince people, I guess, that he was excited too and wanted to know where the <laughs> Messiah was so he could come and visit him. But he had other, he had really other plans in mind, you know. And it's interesting to see that this king became threatened by a baby. Right. Why is this? What's so special about this baby that it upset <laughs> King Herod, already established in office? <coughs> I think it speaks to um, what King Herod, we'd say, wasn't a believer. He was a paranoid, maybe schizophrenic. I mean, he had other relatives killed just because yes, he, he was did. paranoid. Yeah. However, he still valued prophecy. He still yeah. knew in the back of his mind it was yeah. prophesied that, that a baby would be born the king of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And so part of his paranoia recognized it was prophesied. So even in, even in the virgin birth, there is a significance that it fulfilled prophecy. It, it fulfilled prophecy that Joseph was, it wasn't of Joseph's seed, it was, mm -hmm. it was of God. And mm -hmm. I think Herod just uniquely, he acknowledges prophecy, even yeah. though we would consider him far from God, but he still felt that. I think it's interesting. Well, if you put yourself in Herod's shoes, like understanding that he knew <clears throat> that his kingship, like him having that title was only borrowed. It was given to him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't earned. It wasn't something that was his. It was given to him by the Romans. A political appointment. Yes. Right. So when there comes somebody that says, hey, there is a legit king that is above uh -huh. even those that gave you your kingdom. I mean, yeah, because he bought it. He, whatever he had to do to get it. He's like, I want to keep this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what would any of us do? we would try and keep our position. I mean, human is human, right? Yeah, so yeah. when you try and put yourself in there, like I totally get what he's trying to do. I mean, I'm not gonna go that far to trying to kill a baby, but you know, I get it. Yeah. You know, interesting uh, kind of a practical theological point here is that anytime God does something, the enemy always counterpoints or counter strikes, yes. right? Yes. So the son of God is born and the enemy knowing sets out to destroy it. And I think that practical in the sense that anytime God does something in our lives, the enemy is always there to block it, to devour mm -hmm. it. And uh, I love Christmas because not only do we get, uh, you know, all the sentiment and things like that, and we go through the story, <laughs> but 
it's so practical, it's so down to earth. We see Jesus born in a feeding trough. We, <laughs> there was no room at the end. They didn't have the cloud. He was, this, I, I love our Savior because he's so relatable. He wasn't mm. born in the marble halls of Rome. Mm. He yeah. was born in a stable in Bethlehem. You know, and even more to speak to that, I think that's such a great point, the, the way in which he came. It's funny to think the king of kings fled to Egypt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The threat came, and yes. instead, of, instead of rising up and squashing, that wasn't his mantra, was it? The oh, mantra no. was yeah. the it wasn't cross. His, yeah, yeah. So even the first threat, what happened? An angel warned Mary and Joseph, take him to Egypt. And that was to fulfill prophecy. Yeah. Out of yeah. Egypt I will call my son. So it just speaks mm -hmm. to the way in which Jesus pursues people. The way in which Christmas communicates the message of yeah. God's humble um, human love, if you will. It connects right where people are at. I think that's, that's yeah. something incredible, too. Yeah. It's just incredible. I, I get encouraged by something you said here about the timing, God's timing. Mm -hmm. Out of all the attempts to take Christ's life, it never, it, it, they could never pull it off until it was the right time. And it was his own time. He called the shots. Because yeah. right. after all, he told everybody, nobody around you is going to take my life. He says, I have the power to lay it down yeah. and take it up. But does it not <laughs> also speak in today's vernacular about how important <laughs> it is for us in our moving forward in our lives to move according to God's timing mm -hmm. for what we're doing and not get ahead of God in doing this and that and the other, even though we may have good motives and good yeah. intentions, but moving in God's timing with what we do. The hard thing is, is that, you know, Jesus was God. And so therefore he knew the timing. <laughs> so the hard thing for us is, is that we have to discern uh -huh. what God uh -huh. is doing. Uh -huh. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you see in scripture and, and, and I can point out in times of my life and, and watch other people where we try and rush God's timing. I'll, um, I'll raise both hands to that. And, 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 well, and, and, and God will slap you down. <laughs> I, I mean, just to put it plainly. And then other times when, when he just, instead of we drag our feet, God pushes you forward or he drags you and, mm -hmm. you know, um, but it all comes down to our, our heart. Yes. You know, and, and if your heart is that you want to see God move and you, and you want to be obedient to him, he is always faithful with that, you know, and um, it doesn't matter if, if you interpret the timing right or wrong, God will, will bless that your heart is pure and wanting him and he, he will find grace and mercy with you. And, and you see that, you know, um, even Jesus, um, throughout his life working with people and especially the disciples of, of just working with them because you know the question is okay you know um, it will last time I was on here we, we asked well <coughs> why did God you know pray for Peter but not Judas well it's the heart motive and then you know God worked with all those disciples until even Judas until he wasn't yeah. willing yeah. to work yeah. for God mm -hmm. and um, you know so when you're talking about timing and different things like that you know it's just important to remember, you know, it is God who we serve and God who we obey. And I know I'm going to screw it up. I just hope I don't <laughs> screw it up as bad as I mm. Well, yeah, mm. I think timing also comes down, as you're saying, to trust in the yeah. sense that you, you can't, you, you've got to be mindful of it, not overly scrupulous where you're worrying and worrying and in anxiety because is this God's timing or not? You know, you pray about it, you leave it with him and, and you, you claim Ecclesiastes <laughs> chapter three. You know, there's, there's a season for everything, a time and a purpose to everything under heaven. And, and Jesus definitely shows us that, that no, no matter what anyone tries to do to the plan of God for your life, it happens only in the timing, in the season yeah. that God has set for you. But when you think about the timing, though, so Jesus came at the appropriate time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Mary knew that. Mm -hmm. Joseph knew that. Mm -hmm. The shepherds knew that. Mm -hmm. And the wise men knew that. Yeah. Nobody else knew it because mm -hmm. what happened in that next timing was... Herod sent out soldiers to kill children. Uh -huh. mm. Trying to get there to is Jesus. no way that this appears to be anything like perfect timing to everybody else. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I love so that. there's yeah. a you mystery know? to God's timing, and, and oh, so yeah. even that yeah. verse in Galatians where it says <clears throat> we are to keep in step with the Spirit. So the Spirit was was the the, ori the originator of, of the virgin birth. But I think about even the timing of Jesus um, wants to begin ministry. Right. But it's the spirit that takes him to the wilderness first. Yeah. So there, yeah. there, there is yeah. a, there is a, mm -hmm. there is a limit to my grasp on what's best for me and the timing and that sort mm. of nature. And I just want to be in step with the spirit. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there are signs when you're out of step. 
perspective, oh, or yeah. when you're pushing your agenda, yeah. or when you're complacent, right? But there is a there is a kind of contentment that, that leads to, I have to be dependent on God, yeah. and there's a contentment in being dependent. So I, it's I interesting when that. when it is right, it feels right, generally. <laughs> yeah. Am I right about that? Yeah. But when God, when you're saying stay in step with the Spirit, I mean, let's point out what you said. It was the Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness to yeah. be what? Tempted. Tested. Yeah. Tested. Yeah. Yeah. So Tested. sometimes being in step with the Spirit isn't going to the good and right thing. Sometimes it's going to the difficult and hard thing. Oh, yeah. The challenges of Because life. God wants to grow you. He wants to have this interactive relationship with you where you want Him and He just so longs for us. And that's the dependence. Our mm -hmm. contentment comes from when I am fully dependent, which means I'm acknowledging this is out of my control. I a lot of times don't like that. But it seems that's the that's the best place to be mm -hmm. when I'm really dependent on God for what's next. I love the the passage. You know, God's word is a light into our path. It's mm -hmm. not a spot. It's not a spotlight for the miles. It's yeah. just enough for the next step. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's yeah. being in step. God, yeah. what is next? Yeah, that's all I need. And this is where it really means of <laughs> I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not that I can do all things. It's as long I'm with Christ, yeah. I can do all things. Whether Christ leads me into a hard time mm -hmm. or into a good time or into a season of just being at rest, I can do all of those things because God is with me. Yeah, I have a, a, a saying that I put in my computer that I that I read every morning that tells me that with the with the anointing, I can do all things with Christ, but without the anointing, I am as any other man. Yes. I have to remind myself of that yeah. because I think what you're talking about overall is the battle between the flesh and our, and our spirit. Mm -hmm. The flesh wanting to go one way and our human spirit wanting to follow God mm -hmm. and be under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you think about, you know, so after Jesus was born, you know, um, <clears throat> Mary and Joseph thought, okay, we've got the... We got the Son of God here, okay? We got a huge responsibility. And then they have to go to Egypt. Like, what's with that? You know? <laughs> and they have to stay there until Herod dies. Yeah. They stay there well, yeah. Until he dies. And then what happens? What? Then they start coming back and mm -hmm. they find out that who? Somebody else is king. Well, we can't go there. Yeah. yeah. Right? So they're they're scared. With, yeah. So, I mean, they, they, they've yeah, got yeah. this huge blessing that comes yeah. from God they and they're scared. Like one. You know? How often have we had this huge blessing from God? And we're scared. Yeah. 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 And we wonder where we're supposed to go yeah. and what yeah. we're supposed to do. We feel called to our ministries, right? Yeah. And sometimes you're like, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're doing? You know, I don't, I'm not sure about this. I'm, I'm not comfortable with this. You know, I need another message. Yeah. I want to run. Yeah. I want to run. <laughs> yeah. you know. Well, we've, we, you know, we've, we've gone over time for the break, but I did not want to interrupt the flow. This, this was tremendous. Let's, let's take a short break and let's come back and try to wrap this up with some more wholesome stuff for our audience. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back. Thank you for being with us. Let's segue now from Jesus the baby to him coming up under the tutelage of his earthly father, Joseph, and, and, and becoming a, gaining a, a skill as a carpenter, just like his dad and the like. Um, we're seeing in this day and time, in this modern age, I know it from the questions we get in the mail. Parents who are concerned because they raise their children in a godly manner, teaching them the Bible and the like, they go off to, to college. And they come back with a different worldview that says, Mom and Dad, you're out of step with what's really going on in the world today. You know, you need to get with it. That religion is, is for the ancient times. How do you deal with that? Whether you experience it personally or whether you're experiencing it in your ministry, in, in your congregation with any of your parishioners and the like, how do you deal with that? Not, not well, fast answers. Huh? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the one thing that every parent knows is that parenting is tough. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. All we can do, I think, is to, to as Proverbs uh, 22, uh, verse 6 says, train up your child in the way that they should go. And when they're older, they'll not depart. So you do your best to be, the, be an example to them of who Christ is, what he looks like in real life. 
And then ultimately we have to trust them to the Lord. So we do our part, but ultimately God has them. And you know, uh, we have to, as they say, cut the apron strings when they go off to college. Mm -hmm. We have to just mm -hmm. let them go. And you know, sometimes when, when children develop uh, maybe a rebellious attitude uh, towards the things of God, and, and, and God forbid that they do, but it happens, is that part of that is just them growing, maturing, and developing. And, and we have to say, okay, God, my hands are off. I'm going to pray. I'm going to trust. And, and I know that you're, you're true to your word, and you're going to bring them back eventually. But that is probably one of the, the, the greatest soul-rending events for any parent. Oh, yes. When a child you know, not just leaves the house, but leaves the faith, or it appears like they mm -hmm, are. So, mm -hmm. and one thing I do know is that it keeps you on your knees. So whether they leave the house or they're in the house and you can see their attitude and, and their faith wavering, it, it is certainly a trial of faith. So how do we deal with it? And I know this is a cliche answer, but by faith, we have to mm -hmm. simply say, God, here's what you've said. They're yours, ultimately, you know, and, and mm -hmm. generally as evangelicals, we're dedicating our children, right? Mm -hmm. And what are we saying? Lord, we're going to do our best, but ultimately they're yours. We're giving them to you. You've loaned them to us. We're giving them back to you. And we trust that they're your children, even though right now they might not be acting like yeah. you. And I, I guess what's tough, too, is the fact that now they're out from under your, um, your tutelage and the like, mm -hmm. and they get to make their own decisions legally. Yes. That adds, and they'll throw that in your face. Well, the important thing to know is, is that if you have young kids, um, which my oldest is 12, my youngest is six, I have three, one in the middle of nine, and, you know, is, is that you're going to screw up as a parent. And I don't say that to yeah. just, you know, say it's, it's pointless. It's I'd say that truism. that's just the truth. So <laughs> take the pressure off. Um, I've screwed up with my kids. Um, <clears throat> my parents screwed up with me. Mm -hmm. It's just human nature. Um, so knowing that then is, is, you need to be able to live real life in front of your kid and not live two different lives of out in public and, um, you know, at home, right. which is extremely hard as pastors, right? And, um, and so being able to apologize for your kids and telling them, hey, I was wrong here. Um, my wife continually tells me, you need to choose your battle. And, you know, a lot of times I choose the wrong battle. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and lean on your spouse um, when, when you've had enough and you know that you can't, you know, you, you go to them and you, mm -hmm. you need to deal with this or, or work yeah. these things out. But basically you're creating mm -hmm. a relationship for when your kid goes to college to where they will come to you and so want to have your knowledge. Um, one of the things that um, I have respected um, about my wife is is that she does you know respect her father's opinion and has gone to him on different things like that and that's what i want my kids to have when they go off to college and come across some of these things mm -hmm. the other thing that i try and do with my kids is is it's just foundation they have to know that that absolute truth does exist that <clears throat> scripture is absolute truth and that god knows better than any one of us he knows better than me he knows better than they do and if i don't know the answer then then the bible has it we just need to find it together yeah. it's become a battleground you, you got two things one don't we have to start early on yes with them. the earlier we, and even statistics tell us that the earlier we start getting them converted the better secondly most importantly the battlefield has changed. I mean, look at what technology has brought before our children today, where they're mm -hmm. now texting and the like rather than talking, um, where, there, where a lot of things are now legal. I mean, marijuana is legal in, what, seven, nine states now for recreational use? Uh, and in 33 states, there, there's some form of legalization of marijuana. So that which appears to have been wrong all these years now is right mm -hmm. before our children because mm -hmm. of the changing yes. of laws. How do you deal with that? I think it, I think it speaks to the, the, <clears throat> the necessity for parents today to have courage to talk about um, difficult topics, maybe even topics that have been taboo or we even talked about in the past. Well, now you, you best be talking about sexuality with your kids, especially if they're in those middle school years. I mean, you really have to create a, a space where they're comfortable talking to you about it or else they're not going to talk to you about it when they're in college. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're just going to, there's the silence, is, and then you might find yourself surprised. But mm -hmm. being willing to say, hey, I'm going I'm to bring up this topic, and I want to talk to you about it. I, wanna, I also want to show you that the Bible isn't archaic. 
<laughs> it actually yeah, speaks it to transgender yeah. and homosexuality. Yes, it does. It speaks it does. to marriage. It speaks to same-sex marriage. It, it actually speaks to these things. And not just in a do or don't. It speaks in an honest, authentic, genuine way. Mm -hmm. If we aren't equipped ourselves for that, uh, how are we ex going to expect our kids to be equipped with that? So and I think we got to we got to press in on those things. And you know, we we have to say what all of what you're saying because it it adds to the protection they need. When I did television news, I remember riding in the back seat of the police car with my cameraman as we would go around to different drug busts. And you'd go in and you'd see these places where they had all the drug paraphernalia and everything there to, s to sell, where they would have stacks and stacks of cocaine and marijuana, like waiting for your kids and mine. Right. I mean, the, the, the battlefield is different. It, it's so different. Well, I think just the, uh, you know, the statistics tell us that you know, the, um, the Christian faith is on the decline, yes. right? And so when we think back to when we were kids growing up, there were, we had more Christian friends probably than what our kids today have Christian friends. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our, our Christian friends had parents who were going to church. Our kids today don't have that. So right, right there, it, we, we lose a sense of uh, support. You know, um, the, the kids don't have that other kind of peer support. They have peer pressure. Yes. To try and experiment and do other things. They don't have as many maybe accountability friends who say, you know, you shouldn't do that. We know that that's wrong. We went to youth group together. We know that we shouldn't do that. Yeah. They don't have that kind of thing. So they're, they're more out there on their own in many ways than what we were as kids growing up. Do you see us using the Word of God, for instance, to train parents <coughs> to be parents in the home and <coughs> also to develop programs within the church that support parents so that when they bring the child to the church, the church is saying the same thing the parents are saying at home? No. And I hang do on to your first, do, do we see parents using the Word of God? No. I don't even see the church using the Word of God to speak into a lot of the, the topics here. We talk about the topic and what God thinks and views, but we don't sit there and say, well, well, let's dive into the word, let's study it, let's find out, and, and not just about the topic, yes or no, about, but about this, the, the greater of what does God want for us as a people, and that mm -hmm. is to be righteous. And so what does righteousness look like? What does, you know, being holy as Jesus was being holy, like, what does that mean? And, and not because Jesus simply said to, because that's the best for us. And, and if you truly want the best for your kids, if you truly want them to succeed and to have the most healthy life that they can, then it is doing it as God instructed us to do it. But no, we don't sit there. A lot of churches, and, and, and especially within the culture and political realm, like we just talk about the topic and, and then we throw God into it. You know, well, you know, God this, God that. But we don't sit there and say, well, well wait a minute. You know, like when we're sitting there talking about sins and we, we look at the Corinthian church, when Paul sits there and writes, he says, you know, all these sins, homosexualities and their murder, greed, lie, all these things. The next verse there, I, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, such as you were yeah, yeah. with mm -hmm. these things. Uh -huh. Well, you were sinners yeah. with all of these. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it was, if it was greed or, or murder or lying or, or just sexual orientation, like yeah. you were all sinners and yet you're redeemed. Yeah. Right. We're going to have to leave it go there. You know what? I'm going to invite you all back next week. We'll double <laughs> your salary, okay? <laughs> you come back next week. Thank you very much. We're going to continue uh, next week on this same subject. We're going to start off again with what we can do to support kids. Okay. We'll be back, we'll be back again next week at the same time. Till then, I'm Bill Harris. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.